I am so glad to see all of you this morning. How are you guys doing? Good. Now, I have a question for all of you as you come and find a seat. Have you guys ever made a mistake? Yeah? I know I have. I made a pretty big mistake this past week, and I had to go and ask for somebody's forgiveness. Have you guys had to experience that? Yeah. Now, sometimes we make little mistakes. They seem like just little things. And sometimes we make big mistakes. And we also experience the consequences of those mistakes. But there's also good news. Do you know what the good news is? Even when we make mistakes, God still loves us. Today we're going to be hearing a story from the Old Testament about King David. You guys know who King David is? King David was a man after God's own heart, and he became the ruler over the kingdoms of Israel and Judah, but he got a little big for his britches. And he made some pretty big mistakes that caused a lot of harm for people, and a man even died because of it. Now, David, he thought that he was too big, he couldn't be touched, and he didn't do anything to fix his mistakes, but then God sent the prophet Nathan to go and tell David a story to help him realize that the mistakes he had made were a big deal and he needed to repent or say he was sorry. And David realized what a big deal this was and he said, I have sinned before the Lord. He had to ask for God's forgiveness. So David still suffered the consequences of his mistakes, but he recognized what was wrong, he asked for God's forgiveness, and he moved forward trying to do what was right after that. So even though we are tempted and we make mistakes and we do things that are wrong, we can trust that God loves us even so. When we ask for God's forgiveness, God will give us forgiveness and God gives us the power to go and sin no more, to do our best to do what is right and avoid what is wrong. So I want to give you guys encouragement this week to try to live into the power God gives you not to make mistakes. But if you make a mistake, Just trust in God. Say, God, I love you. I want to do better. Please forgive me. You think you can do that? I bet you can. Let's have a prayer together. Will you repeat after me? God, we thank you for your great love. And we thank you for your forgiveness. Help us to be the people you want us to be. Amen. During this series, Leadership According to Samuel, we focused on King David, described as a person after God's own heart, who became the most powerful leader of Israel, who served as a model for all the kings who came after him, and even a forerunner of the Messiah. But David was still subject to human brokenness and sin. That's what this story is about. Today's lesson is from the book of 2 Samuel beginning with chapter 11 and continuing to chapter 12, verse 13. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. In the spring of the year, when kings normally go out to war, David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. They destroyed the Ammonite army and laid siege to the city of Rabbah. However, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. Late one afternoon, after his midday rest, David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of the palace. As he looked out over the city, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. He sent someone to find out who she was, and he was told, She is Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam, and wife of Uriah, the Hittite. Then David sent messengers messengers to get her, and when she came to the palace, he slept with her. She had just completed the purification rites after having her menstrual period. Then she returned home. Later, when Bathsheba discovered that she was pregnant, she sent David a message saying, I'm pregnant. Then David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. So Joab sent him to David. When Uriah arrived, David asked him how Joab and the army were getting along and how the war was progressing. Then he told Uriah, go on home and relax. David even sent a gift to Uriah after he left the palace. But Uriah didn't go home. He slept that night at the palace entrance with the king's palace guard. When David heard that Uriah had not gone home, he summoned him and asked, What's the matter? Why didn't you go home last night after being away for so long? Uriah replied, The ark and the armies of Israel and Judah are living in tents, and Joab and my master's men are camping in the open fields. How could I go home to wine and dine and sleep with my wife? 
I swear that I would never do such a thing. Well, stay here today, David told him, and tomorrow you may return to the army. So Uriah stayed in Jerusalem that day and the next. Then David invited him to dinner and got him drunk. But even then, he couldn't get Uriah to go home to his wife. Again, he slept at the palace entrance with the king's palace guard. So the next morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and gave it to Uriah to deliver. The letter, the letter instructed Joab, Station Uriah on the front lines where the battle is fiercest, then pull back so that he will be killed. So Joab assigned Uriah to a spot close to the city wall where he knew the enemy's strongest men were fighting. And when the enemy soldiers came out of the city to fight, Uriah the Hittite was killed along with several other Israelite soldiers. And then Joab sent a battle report to David. He told his messenger, report all the news of the battle to the king. But he might get angry and ask, why did the troops go so close to the city? Didn't they know there would be shooting from the walls? Wasn't Abimelech, son of Gideon, killed at Thebes by a woman who threw a millstone down on him from the wall? Why would you get so close to the wall? Then tell him, Uriah the Hittite was killed too. So the messenger went to Jerusalem and gave a complete story report to David. The enemy came out against us in the open fields, he said, and as we chased them back to the city gate, the archers on the wall shot arrows at us. Some of the king's men were killed, including Uriah the Hittite. Well, tell Joab not to be discouraged, David said. The sword devours this one today and that one tomorrow. Fight harder next time and conquer the city. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. When the period of mourning was over, David sent for her and brought her to the palace, and she became one of his wives. Then she gave birth to a son, but the Lord was displeased with what David had done. So the Lord sent Nathan, the prophet, to tell David this story. There were two men in a certain room. One was rich and one was poor. The rich man owned a great many sheep and cattle. The poor man owned nothing but one little lamb he had bought. He raised that little lamb, and it grew up with his children. It ate from the man's own plate and drank from his cup. He cuddled it in his arms like a baby daughter. One day, a guest arrived at the home of the rich man, but instead of killing an animal from his own flock or herd, he took the poor man's lamb and killed it and prepared it for his guests. David was furious. As surely as the Lord lives, he vowed, any man who would do such a thing deserves to die. He must repay four lambs to the poor man for the one he stole and for having no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are that man. The Lord, the God of Israel, says, I anointed you king of Israel and saved you from the power of Saul. I gave you your master's house and his wives and the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. And if that had not been enough, I would have given you much, much more. Why then have you despised the word of the Lord and done this horrible deed? For you have murdered Uriah the Hittite with the sword of the Ammonites and stolen his wife. From this time on, your family will live by the sword because you have despised me by taking Uriah's wife to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Because of what you have done, I will cause your own household to rebel against you. I will give your wives to another man before your very eyes, and he will go to bed with them in public view. You did it secretly, but I will make this happen to you openly in the, light, in the sight of all Israel. Then David confessed to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Power. We hear a lot about power these days, don't we? particularly the power of leaders. We've read stories in the news about leaders seeking to expand their power. In, in such countries, as at least a couple of examples, uh, as uh, Russia and Turkey, when a quote-unquote elected leader gets to the end of what the, the law or the Constitution says is the end of his term, there's an easy fix for that. Let's just change the law or the Constitution so that that person can remain in power. That's what happens, right? And of course, there's a lot of talk in our country about power. 
isn't there, about the power of the president. Have, have you heard or read anything lately about the power of the president? Anybody? Uh, that's a topic of conversation, isn't it? There are some who think that our current president is the greatest leader that has ever graced the, the face of the earth. And then there are others who think that if, if he stays in office one more day, the whole country is going to completely fall apart, right? But let's not forget that, uh, and there are some who, because of that, of some of those reasons, want to alter our law, somehow our constitution, to change the way we do things to uh, remedy this particular situation. But let's not forget that our most recent president, there were some of his supporters that bemoaned the fact that he could only serve two terms as the Constitution uh, calls for. So they all do it. They all do it. And it's not just the president, but about the power of representatives in Congress and senators and even mayors or chiefs of police or judges. And there's a lot of talk about the abuse of power of people like that, particularly men, I might add, who have a lot of power and who abuse that power and who think that the normal rules of appropriate behavior don't apply to them. And it's not just in government or politics either, is it? Over the last few months in what has come to be called the Me Too movement, there have been multitudes of powerful men in all kinds of arenas who have fallen because for a long time, in many cases, they considered themselves beyond the normal expectations of behavior, particularly toward women. And they've gotten away with it for a long time until recently. Just in the last few days, uh, we read in the news about a cardinal in the Roman Catholic Church, the highest clergy official other than the Pope that exists, who has been removed from his office because of this. And before we start throwing stones at our brothers and sisters in the Roman Catholic Church, let's not forget that our most recent United Methodist Bishop was also removed from office for basically the same thing. And that's really what this scripture from 2 Samuel is about today, isn't it? Here we have King David, the greatest leader in the history of Israel. A king who led his people and created one of the most powerful nations in the region at the time. David is one of the towering figures of faith in the Old Testament and the faith of the Israelites. 64 chapters of scripture are devoted to telling the story of David. That's more than even is devoted to telling the story of Jesus. Half the Psalms, the book of Psalms, were either written by David or were about David or in honor of David. And even more significant than being a leader, the Scriptures tell us that David was a man after God's own heart. He followed the law, established what we still call today the holy city of Jerusalem, gave all of himself to God, did what was right in God's sight and his leadership of the nation. David becomes the example for all other kings to follow and the measure by which all subsequent kings are judged. He even becomes the example of what the Messiah would be. Jesus was called the son of David. David was revered, certainly in biblical times, but even today, the flag of the nation of Israel has as its symbol, what? The star of David. That's what that is. Every Israelite was told the stories of David as they were growing up, so everybody knew him and everyone loved him. David's stories were used to teach the Israelites about faith and life and morality. But this story about David could appear in today's headlines, couldn't it? This story about David teaches that success 
can lead to a skewed perspective of ourselves and our perception of what is right and wrong. Sometimes when we reach the peak of success, we forget that the rules still apply to us. Power like that can bring a sense of entitlement. David rose from a servant boy to successful warrior to great general to become the king of Israel who led that nation to become the largest it would ever be and the wealthiest it would ever be. But along the way, something changed in David. He used to lead his soldiers in battle, but our scripture says today that now he sends them off into battle while he stays home in the comfort of his palace and takes a nap. Did you notice that? That he took a nap? Nothing wrong with naps, unless you're taking a nap while you should be doing what you're supposed to be doing, right? This is the first sign of trouble <laughs> right here. Have you ever heard the saying, idleness is the devil's workshop? Uh-huh. Then one afternoon, as David gets up from his nap in the middle of the day, he sees a woman bathing. Now, what should have been the right response of a man after God's own heart? He should have turned away and gone on about his business. But that's not what David does. David checks out the woman. Or another way we might put it is, he stalked the woman and finds out that she's married. And not only is she married, She's married to one of his own soldiers that he has sent off to battle while he cools his heels at home. Now he could have stopped right and should have stopped right there when he found out that information, but he didn't. He has that desire rise up within him and rather than let it go, he pursues it. And see, that's the struggle with temptation. So what does David do? He has the woman brought to him, and then they sleep together. But this was not only about adultery, don't you see? It's also about the abuse of power. Because Bathsheba, a woman with no rights, no voice in Israelite society, had no choice really but to go with David because he's the king. The most powerful man, not only is he a man, he's the most powerful man in the nation who can put somebody to death with the blink of an eye. And so she's forced to get involved with the king, maybe not physically forced, but certainly politically and socially. And you know, when a woman is coerced into such a relationship, we have a word for that, don't we? It's called rape. So David gives in to temptation and, and this leads him into a tangled web that just keeps getting worse and worse. Have you ever been there? Have you, have you ever been in a place where you made a decision you knew was wrong, but you did it anyway? And then you find yourself immersed in guilt and shame and embarrassment? That's where David is headed here, but he doesn't really realize it yet. That leads me to point number one, which is what happens when we go down a road like David's, even in a weak moment, is that we turn from God rather than turning to God. Now, we all struggle with temptation. That's a part of the human condition. As Martin Luther used to say, you can't stop uh, birds from landing on your head, but you can keep them from building a nest in your hair. Right? We all struggle with temptation. And it's part of the human condition. The Scripture tells us that all of us like sheep have strayed away. We've left God's path to follow our own. And then Romans tells us all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then, of course, John reminds us, if we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves. 
These days, you know, we really don't like to use the word sin, do we? <laughs> so we use other words, euphemisms, like mistakes or shortcomings or little white lies or something like that. But no matter what you call it, it, it still is sin. And we all struggle with that. We know the right thing to do, but like, like a moth that's drawn to the fire, we have a tendency to be lured to the wrong thing to do. And, it, and as enticing and as exciting as it might look, it inevitably takes us to the place of pain and deep gets us in deeper trouble. This is what we see happen with David here. So David has his way with Bathsheba, and then she goes back to her house. But a couple of months later, she finds out she's pregnant. So she, t she tells David this, so he scrambles around trying to cover up his sin. So he hatches a plan to bring Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, back for a weekend furlough with the hope that they'll uh, be together and be off the hook. And he, he calls Uriah in and puts his arm around him and says, Hey, buddy, faithful soldier, how's it been? How is it out there on the front lines? And he wants him to go home and spend time with his wife so he'll be off the hook. But being the faithful soldier that he is and knowing that his own comrades are still on the battlefield, Uriah sleeps on the steps of the palace instead of going back to be with his wife. So David tries another tack. He tra keeps him there a day or two longer and he gets him drunk. You know, you get people drunk, you can get them to be more compliant to what you want. But even then, he still doesn't go. So none of this works to cover up what David's done. So he goes deeper into the web that he's weaving for himself. He sends Uriah back to the battle and instructs General Joab to lead a charge against the enemy. And as they do, so that everyone fighting alongside him is to pull back, leaving him to be killed in battle. And the very message to give these instructions is carried by the one that he's trying to rub out. Isn't that something? And of course, this is what happens. So David goes from being an adulterer and rapist to being a murderer. When you've gotten yourself caught up in a sticky web of sin that you've woven for yourself and you're about to be found out, you kind of can't think straight. You try to fix the problem and end up making it worse. So when Bathsheba hears the news about the death of her husband, she begins to grieve appropriately. And then after that, David offers to take Bathsheba into his harem and take care of her. Isn't that magnanimous of him? What a great king to be so generous with this grieving widow. So David thought he'd fixed it. So now he can kind of move on, move past this. But then along comes a prophet named Nathan. And I have to tell you, Nathan is one of my favorite characters of Scripture. I picture him as being this kind of short little dude of short stature, whereas David, you know, is a big, big man. And he, of course, had no, um, no wealth, no position other than being God's messenger. So he tells David a story about a powerful man who took advantage of someone weaker and more vulnerable. And David reacts to this story, rising up with righteous indignation. And says that anybody who does such a thing as that ought to be held accountable and even punished. And the way I like to picture the way Nathan responds to David's indignation is he stuck his finger in the king's nose and said, You are the man. <laughs> Nathan had, had guts, didn't he? And here's a crucial point in the story. Most of the men we've seen in the news lately who have been called out regarding their behavior have either denied it or minimized it or even made excuses. And some, some of them have actually retaliated and attacked their accusers, seeking to crush them. And David is a king. And in that era, particularly kings, did whatever they wanted. 
without anybody challenging them. And if somebody did challenge them, they crushed them, they killed them, they threw them in a dungeon. And Nathan is this little dude who had no worldly power, no riches. So David could have very well been expected to respond as a king of his era saying, how dare you accuse me, David, the great king of Israel, of doing anything wrong. Of, of doing something I'm not entitled to do. Don't you realize the rules don't apply to me? I make my own rules. But, because that's what kings did. And even today, much of the time, that's what powerful people do. But that's not what David did. <laughs> and this is what sets him apart, you see, as a great leader. David responded when this little prophet came and confronted him with what he had done, his response was to say, I have sinned against the Lord. So he acknowledges what he's done. Unlike certainly most any powerful leader of his day, and unfortunately many powerful leaders of our day, David admits what he's done, and he allows himself to be held accountable. You know, just like we don't like to use the word sin... We don't also like to use the word for what David does here. He repents. Now, his repentance doesn't undo the damage that's been done. That's pretty clear in this text. Even what Nathan says after what we read today, it, God relents in some respects on the consequences, but much of the consequences that he has set in motion continue to take place. But it does restore his relationship with God that sin has broken. So what is the lesson here? What are the lessons here about sin? Well, point, the, the next point are going to have three lessons. So the, the first one is uh, the lessons about sin, and that is sin is personal. It's personal. The gospel of Jesus Christ is first and foremost about Jesus and me. Notice that Dave, David gets easily worked into a frenzy of anger about what somebody else has done. But Nathan tells him, you are the man. And That's where the gospel starts, don't you see? You are the man. You are the woman. The gospel is never first and foremost about somebody else. It's always about my own sin i always want to shift the blame and worry about what somebody else but no god says let's change your marriage let's change your family your neighborhood your school your community or nation and how about if we start with you so sin is personal and then secondly sin is deceptive some time ago, there was a computer virus, some of you may remember this, that was going around and it was called the CLES32 virus. Some of you who work with computers may remember that. And it was a particularly nasty virus because the first thing it did was deactivate your antivirus software on your computer. So your computer didn't know it had a virus, you see. Sin does the same thing. It deactivates our ability to detect it. That's what really happened to David here. He, he slid into sin, lust and assault and adultery and lies and deception and murder. And all the time, he really never saw that. His heart hardened. The deceptiveness of sin is that it really doesn't feel like sin when we're doing it. It really feels godlike. It feels religious even. Fulfilling. It feels fulfilling and satisfying. I love what Eugene Peterson says about this story regarding that he says David didn't feel like a sinner when he sent for Bathsheba he felt like a lover and what can be better than that David didn't feel like a sinner when he sent for Uriah he felt like a king and what can be better than that and all the time his heart dies a little bit more each day because see part of our mess is we can't see our mess <laughs> 
And then the third uh, lesson is that sin has consequences. Notice what happened with David's sin. It impacted more people than he ever imagined. David had no idea that his simple plan to dispose of Uriah would lead to the death of a whole group of other soldiers in his army. Sin never is like that. It never stays in the neat little boxes that we try to create for it. My sin will always have ramifications that I can't predict or control, and my sin has impact wider and deeper than I ever imagined. So sin has consequences. But here is point to ponder number three, and this is the most important part, you see. And that is, although this story focuses on David's sin, it's ultimately a story that ends and focuses on God's invitation to grace. Even in the midst of an ugly story about ugly sin, we find the good news of the gospel here. And the gospel is God's invitation to come to Jesus Christ in the midst of our fallen, ugly, stupid, twisted sin. Everything David did, and it was bad, is wildly outdone by God's grace, don't you see? No one minimizes David's sin here. Don't, I mean, that's certainly all out there for us to see what David did. One of the things I find refreshing about Scripture and a testimony to its truth is unlike the annals of kings of other kings of that time, it doesn't try to cover up what, uh, what David did with fake news, as it were. It's all there for us to see. But even though that's true, God's grace looms larger, infinitely larger, than even David's brokenness and sinfulness. After the experience had ended, David wrote a poem song about his experience of God's grace and forgiveness and his own sinfulness and then God's grace and forgiveness. And you can read it in your Bible. You're probably familiar with it because we're going to use it in a moment as we use it that text for a prayer of confession it's psalm 51 and it's fascinating that in this poem song that david wrote for all of his sinning david only uses four words to describe sin in that song but he uses 19 words to describe god's forgiveness and restoration sin is basically the same stale dull routine we've we've repeat and perpetuate over and over but when it comes to god's grace it's fresh it's original it's surprising every single time it happens it never gets old let us pray Oh God, as we come together in worship and learn from this story of the depth of David's sinfulness and brokenness and the damage that it does, we are put in touch with our own brokenness and sinfulness and the damage done by what we do. But as we put are in touch with that, O oh God, put us in touch as well with your grace that is larger and more powerful than even the depth of the worst that we do. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen.